Hey everybody, in this video I'll be covering my latest project, which is the build of these four Tesla coils. In addition to covering the build process, I'll be going over some basic Tesla coil theory and then giving a demonstration at the end. Tesla coils are a project that I've wanted to do for a long time because they combine so many disciplines within electrical engineering. You'll probably notice that these Tesla coils don't look like the Tesla coils you're used to seeing with a very large secondary winding and a top load. That's because these Tesla coils are entirely printed circuit board based and all of the windings are within printed circuit boards. I was inspired to do this project by a Hackaday post submitted by Nicholas Foth. He wrote up a pretty detailed project log covering all the details of this project. He has a GitHub page with the Gerber files and the firmware required for recreating one of these coils. The reason that I built four coils is because this design supports MIDI input, which allows for each coil to play music. So by having four coils, you can take a song and have each coil play part of the song. If you're interested in the specifics about this design, check out the links in the description to Nicholas's Hackaday post, where he covers the design pretty extensively. I'll also put links to his GitHub page and his YouTube channel, which is definitely worth checking out. Before getting into the build and the demo, let's cover the basic theory that allows Tesla coils to work. There are a few concepts in electromagnetism that are fundamental to understanding Tesla coils. One of these concepts is Ampere's Law. To demonstrate Ampere's Law, we'll start by winding some magnet wire around a bolt. Ampere's Law states that the magnetic field around a wire is proportional to the current flowing through the wire. So in theory, by passing a current through this wire, a magnetic field will be generated following the right-hand rule. The next concept to understand is what is known as Faraday's Law. To demonstrate Faraday's Law, we will be creating a coil out of some more magnet wire and a toilet paper roll. A permanent magnet will then be used to induce an electromotive force in the coil. Faraday's Law states that a change in magnetic field will cause a voltage to be induced into a coil. In the case of the Tesla coil, a change in current in the primary coil creates a magnetic field around the primary. This in turn induces a voltage in the secondary coil. The amount of voltage induced in the secondary coil is proportional to the turn ratio between the primary and secondary coil. Tesla coils will have a very low number of turns on the primary coil and a very large number of turns on the secondary coil in order to maximize the voltage across the secondary. Here I have the coil hooked up to an ammeter, which is essentially a short circuit. Any voltage that is induced into the coil will generate a current that is a function of both the induced voltage and the resistance of the wire. Notice how the ammeter is only measuring current when the magnetic field is changing. This is essentially Faraday's law. Perhaps the most important concept is what is known as resonance. Resonance is achieved when a force is applied to a system at a frequency equal to the natural frequency of the system. Every electrical and mechanical system has one or more frequencies at which resonance can be achieved. To demonstrate resonance, I'll be creating a simple pendulum by hanging a paint can from my ceiling with a piece of string. The resonant frequency of a simple pendulum can be described by this equation. It is simply a function of the acceleration due to gravity and the length of the string between the mass and the pivot point. Filling in the known values, we can solve for this system's natural frequency and then invert the frequency to find the resonant period. Physics says that this system will naturally oscillate with a period of 2.65 seconds. After letting the system reach a steady state, let's start a timer and see if this is true. Seems to be pretty spot on. Now let's see what happens when we apply a force to the system at a period that corresponds to its natural frequency. The energy introduced to the system adds to the energy that's already in it, causing the amplitude to get higher and higher each time. In the case of a Tesla coil, the goal is to apply energy at a time interval that corresponds to the coil's natural frequency, allowing the voltage to get so high that it creates arcs of plasma to the surrounding environment. If we add energy to the system randomly, it will still oscillate, but not in a way that is harmonious with its natural frequency. Let's take a look at what resonance looks like in an electric circuit. This is what is known as a tank circuit or a resonant circuit. Resonant circuits always consist of an inductor and a capacitor arranged in series or parallel. In this example, the capacitor and the inductor are in parallel, and the capacitor has some initial charge. 
Both capacitors and inductors are passive energy storage devices where the capacitor has the ability to store energy in the form of an electric field and the inductor has the ability to store energy in the form of a magnetic field. Given that this is a closed circuit, current is going to flow from the positively charged plate of the capacitor through the inductor to the negatively charged plate of the capacitor. Keep in mind that this animation is using conventional current flow as opposed to electron flow. As current flows through the inductor, a magnetic field will build up as we saw before when demonstrating Ampere's law. Once the capacitor has fully discharged, there will be no more electromotive force to maintain current flow, and the magnetic field will start to collapse. The collapsing magnetic field will induce a voltage across the inductor in the opposite direction in an attempt to continue the flow of current in the direction it had been flowing previously. This will cause a buildup of charge across the capacitor in a polarity that was opposite to how it was charged previously. Once the magnetic field has fully collapsed and the capacitor is fully charged, current will once again flow out of the positive terminal of the capacitor through the inductor to the negatively charged plate of the capacitor. In a circuit that has no resistance, this oscillatory behavior would continue indefinitely. However, similar to the swinging paint bucket losing energy due to air resistance and friction, there will be a loss of energy in the form of heat due to the resistance of the wires in the circuit, causing the oscillation to die out completely unless energy is continuously added to the system. Going back to the paint bucket analogy, it's easy to see the similarity between electrical and mechanical resonance. In the case of electrical resonance, energy is being exchanged between electric and magnetic fields. In the case of mechanical resonance, energy is being changed from kinetic to potential and back again. Taking these concepts, let's build up a block diagram for how one could create a system capable of generating tens to hundreds of thousands of volts or even more. Breaking this down into functional blocks, there is a primary resonance circuit comprised of a single turn coil and a series tank capacitor. The secondary resonance circuit is comprised of two 190 turn coils connected in series and the capacitance comes from the own coil's self-capacitance and capacitance to earth and the surroundings. A flyback boost converter is used to step up the 5 volt USB voltage to approximately 53 volts. Two half bridges are used to create a full bridge using GANFETs. GANFETs are used because of their performance at high switching frequencies. A microcontroller is used for feedback control as well as to modulate the coils in the audible frequency range based on the MIDI input coming over USB. A shunt resistor is placed in series with the secondary coil so that the microcontroller can measure the current on the secondary and compensate for changes in the secondary's resonant frequency during operation. It should be noted that this design also includes a dead time circuit which prevents each half bridge from having both of its GANFETs on at the same time. This would result in a short circuit and destroy the transistors. Also, the microcontroller is optically coupled to the high voltage circuitry to keep it isolated. To see the full schematic, you can clone Nicholas's GitHub repo and view the schematic as a PDF. Okay, now that we have an understanding of how this design works, let's get into the build. Because this design is comprised mostly of surface mount components, I've used a stencil to apply solder paste and will be reflowing the boards in an oven. My friend Joe helped me laser cut two base plates, which will be used as the mechanical structure. Thanks, Joe. Thanks again for watching, and I'd like to give one last big thanks to Nicholas for putting so much work into this design and making it open source. Last but not least, here's the final demo.